So I think we should get started. Again, welcome everybody. Thank you for joining us on this lovely September afternoon. Again, my name is Jeff O'Handley, Program Director for Otsego County Conservation Association. This is our latest in a series called Spotlight on Invasives. Uh, this is our summer summary, although it will also cover a little bit of time before the summer. So uh, more of a year to date summary of the activities that we've been doing as far as invasive species um, and as well as where we hope to go. Just some uh, quick ground rules. Uh, if you are entering, um, please remember to mute yourself. I think we are muted on entry, but just in case, um, feel free to use the chat bar to say hello and to ask questions as we go. And you may ask questions at any time. Um, we just ask for muting yourself because that way we don't get extraneous sounds in the background. Uh, I'll also mention that this uh, webinar is being recorded and will be available at our YouTube channel, page, whatever you call these things, um, uh, afterwards, uh, once it's processed and all. So we're going to get started and I think I am now going to turn off my camera so that I don't see myself. Um, and hopefully everybody will hear me. <clears throat> So first things first, uh, what is OCCA? Most of you are probably familiar with us, but we are a private nonprofit organization founded in 1968. Uh, we were founded by a group of citizens who were originally concerned about sustainable forestry issues. Uh, our mission is to promote the appreciation and sustainable use of Otsego County's natural resources through research, education, advocacy, planning, resource management, and practice. And, uh, you know, so it's a long way from forest, uh, you know, forest resources, protecting forest resources. Um, our, we, our program areas include invasive species, water quality, municipal planning, solid waste and recycling, et cetera, et cetera. We have a full-time staff of three, uh, one part-time person and uh, several seasonal interns that come in and out at different times. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, this is me. Uh, I was a wildlife science major in college many, many years ago. Found myself uh, in the field of education where I have been uh, for 30 plus years, hard to believe. Uh, I've been with OCCA as program director since 2013, though I have been uh, involved with the organization since my family moved up here in 2002, three. I can't even remember anymore. Um, and this picture is, you know, kind of where I've spent a lot of time this summer, uh, knee deep in the swamp, so to speak. So our program today is going to cover kind of three uh, areas. First, we'll do our kind of required introduction to invasive species, which will be very brief. In part two, we will go over the year in review of our invasive species programs, uh, most of them. And in part three, we will talk a little bit about what is next, what we see as happening. So if you've uh, sat in on any of my programs previously, you know I always like to use these images. Um, when we talk about invasive species, we often think about these you know, horrible monsters, invaders from outer space or, or something coming to take over the human race. <clears throat> um, the, real, the reality is far more severe, serious. Uh, invasive species are organisms that are not native to the environment in question and whose introduction causes or is likely to cause harm to the environment, the economy, and or human health. So if you have a species that is not native to the area and it is likely to do harm to any one of those things, it can be considered an invasive species. Um, and I will also add that, you know, this time of year, a lot of times people look around and they see all the goldenrod in the fields and it looks invasive because it looks like it's taking over. Um, that does not meet the quality, the, the criteria for invasive species typically because goldenrod is a native species and typically it does not do any damage. It might be considered a nuisance um, for a couple of reasons, but it would not rise to the category of invasive species. Okay. Um, when we look at invasives, uh, I always like to show this sort of curve. The vertical axis on the left shows the area infested by an invasive and on the right, the cost. So 
as, uh, as you see, as you move up uh, the vertical axes, as the area infested increases, the cost of control is also going to increase. Okay. Um, and also very typically in an in invasion by an invasive species starts with a few individuals um, where the numbers are low and the area of infestation is low, the costs of controlling or eradication, which means you know completely eliminating it from the environment, um, is also low. And it's also much more likely. Okay. Um, over time, as the population increases, the costs associated with eradication increase and the likelihood of success of actual eradication decreases. When you get to the upper right area of the curve, uh, quite often you're dealing with you know, an impossible task as far as total elimination and you're looking at local control only. Um, uh, so you know, a, a common plant, Japanese knotweed, <coughs> excuse me again, um, is in the upper right area. And, and for many of our invasive species, we're, we're kind of in that upper right area. Um, but we also, when, you know, when we deal with invasive species, what we want to do is make sure that the species that we have that are in our upper right area aren't spreading out of our region into a place where they're not found. Okay. Um, typically, uh, what we aim for is prevention, just like, you know, the doctor says, right, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. Um, you know, you really, ideally, our efforts are mostly aimed in the lower left area. Okay. Um, because again, it gets harder and more expensive to deal with the problem over time and with increased area. So I want to talk about, we have really three types of invasive programs that we emphasize at OCCA. Uh, the first category would be early detection rapid response. Uh, secondary would be management, which includes eradication and more typically control. And the third area is education. And just to go back again, so early detection is something we're aiming at species that are in this area, that are low population, low area infested, um, you know, typically new, right? And rapid response goes along with uh, early detection. So let's take a look at early detection. So again, the goal of early detection and rapid response is to have a coordinated um, effort to find and eradicate invasives before they really cause harm, before they can really spread. Okay. Um, in 2019, OCCA received a three-year grant from the New York State Department of Environmental Conservation for aquatic invasive species rapid early detection rapid response. Okay. Um, so again, the idea on this is to set up a monitoring plan for some of our water bodies to look for certain high priority invasive species. And the two species that we're concentrating on in this particular pro program are water chestnut and European frogbit. Okay. Um, so what we did is identify priority water bodies that are likely uh, that we think are likely to be infested or to become infested, um, get out and survey those water bodies, hopefully not find anything, but if we do to, uh, take a certain, take some action. Okay. Um, and the reason we chose these particular species in the case of water chestnut, we already have it here in um, Otsego County uh, in somewhat small numbers. Okay. Uh, whereas European frog bit before we uh, got this grant had been found in one water body in Otsego County. Okay. So these are high priority species for our region um, that, that the state, the DEC uh, and others want to know where are they, if they're here, where are they, what numbers. Okay. So what we did is last year and again this year we set up surveys of, of water bodies and what we looked at is, is the water body directly connected to another water body that has one of these AIS species in it, aquatic invasive species in it, and that became a, a high priority survey. Um, is it in close proximity where, you know, perhaps a waterfowl is likely to transport it the short distance from one water body to another? And is it a, um, a water body that is used by many people from many different areas who are likely to 
inadvertently transport these invasive species in. So we started monitoring last year. This year uh, we had the following survey sites, uh, Allen Lake up near Richfield Springs, Goodyear Lake, Summit Lake uh, way up towards Van Hornsville up at the northern end of the county. Um, and in the case of, of Allen Lake uh, and Summit Lake in particular, that's based on proximity to a known, known uh, infested areas. Silver Lake was a place where we knew, um, and we'll talk about this a little bit later, that we had both frogbit and water chestnut. Larchwood Lake in Lawrence, uh, a portion of the Unadilla River connected to Silver Lake. Cripple Creek, which runs between Weaver Lake in Herkimer County and Otsego Lake. Shipman Pond, which is a small area, a small pond uh, in Springfield. Beekman's Bog, which is a wetland pond area up in Cherry Valley, Otsego Lake, uh, portions of Otsego Lake. Okay, so these were 10 uh, areas in particular where we focused um, a lot of time and attention. We also had some other sites that we, we looked at peripherally or on a, a, a less, I'm trying to think of how I would say it, uh, <laughs> basis. Okay. So what did our early detection result uh, reports find? Uh, we found a small, very small infestation of water chestnut in Allen Lake, which we removed by hand that day. In Larchwood Lake over in Lawrence, we found a, a large population of water chestnut in one section of the pond. We did some removal there, but we also sent some recommendations to the Lake Association affiliated there with how to approach it. Uh, in Cripple Creek, we found some European frogbit, and this was in areas where we had not found it previously. So it's spreading a little bit. Shipman Pond was new water chestnut, which was reported to us originally by a uh, friend of the organization. Uh, and an unnamed pond in Milford, again, a, a friend of the organization, a professional in uh, aquatics, uh, spotted it on while driving by. So what do we do uh, with early detection? Once we, uh, we find new species, uh, one of the things that we do is enter the information on IMAP Invasives. This is a website, an online database. Um, that uh, New York State participates in along with, I think it's like eight or 10 other states and several Canadian provinces. So uh, on the upper right, what you see is part of an entry card for Frogbit. Uh, you enter information about the location, uh, GPS coordinates, um, notes about the size of the infestation, where it was found, when it was found, is it in flower, what extent, you know, is it, is it an individual plant, is it, you know, a monoculture, how much area does it cover, okay. Um, IMAP helps to organize it, the database in different ways, it's hard to see, but this lower right area here, that yellow shaded area is a searched area that shows an, an area where we uh, spent several hours searching. The dots in here represent particular uh, records of uh, the species being found. You can also see that we did a search up here. This is part of Cripple Creek here. Okay, so, and, and once you do find a species, then you develop a plan. How, how are we going to approach it? Is it something, you know, such as at Allen Lake, we were able to hand remove the plants on site while we were there. That's the kind of rapid response. And then you go back and visit it again in the future. Um, in other cases with the size of the infestation, it may call for a more uh, robust, I guess I would say um, a more aggressive uh, treatment plan. So we'll talk, let's talk a little bit about rapid response um, for one of the sites in question. Um, this will be for Clark Pond in Springfield. So uh, in 2018, we identified Clark Pond as a priority site to survey. And the reason we did is that Clark Pond is connected to Weaver Lake via Cripple Creek. Uh, and it's fairly far distance. And on a certain level, we felt that, that Cripple Creek itself is not really good habitat for European frogbit. And nevertheless, we were concerned um, looking at Weaver Lake, we had seen that frogbit, which has been seen there since probably about 2011 or so, was actually kind of 
in areas where it looked to be escaping the, the, the lake. And we were concerned that in high storm events, um, it may carry the plants or uh, reproductive parts of the plant downstream and deposit it. So in 2018, we, our, our team went out to survey in uh, Clark Pond and they indeed found it. They found a plant uh, in the, it was actually in the creek, like right around over here somewhere. Okay. Um, so we organized a volunteer crew in August of 2018 and we rounded up, oh, 2018, no, I'm sorry, 2019, my mistake. Uh, we rounded up approximately 20 plants. We had our volunteers kind of walk the perimeter of, of this pond um, and kayak up the creek and we found approximately 20 plants and we removed them all. But we knew that we wanted to come back again. And so this or earlier this summer, we visited uh, Clark Pond and Cripple Creek. And in our surveys in June, we found a much more widespread infestation. Okay, we found more plants in more locations than we had originally. Okay, and one of our other concerns is that this drains directly to Otsego Lake down here in the lower right is a dam. Uh, spillway and Cripple Creek widens and flows directly into Otsego Lake. And indeed, we found th three plants out in this section of Cripple Creek. Um, we also followed up by surveying the upper part of Otsego Lake. Okay, so what did we do? What was our rapid response? Well, we assembled teams uh, and we went out. Now, what you're seeing up here on the left hand side is uh, part of the pond it, in midsummer, it is very thick with emergent vegetation. You have cattails around a substantial portion of it. You have, you know, water lilies um, growing up. Um, the water in this part of it is very, very shallow and the mud is very, very deep. So, you know, it looks like this person is, you know, thigh deep in water. It's, she's actually probably about six inches of water and two feet or so of mud. Okay, this is our, on the right is Paul Lord from the SUNY Oneonta Biological Field Station in frog bit hunting gear. <laughs> the rakes actually help you stay on your feet, gives you balance and helps you get, you find stuff. Okay, uh, again, a couple of our volunteers. Um, there's lots of woody debris in this pond. So walking through it is also tricky. Um, Here's uh, one of our volunteers in the cattails where, you know, there's water and potentially frog bit. And here's a couple of volunteers finding it, having found frog bit. So what did this rapid response result in in Clark Pond? Uh, we spent about nine hours in the pond or in the fringes over two days. Uh, we had about 15 volunteers total and we removed about 100 pounds of European frog bit. Okay. Um, we like to believe we got it all. So eradication here is the goal. We do not want this returning. Okay. Um, we don't know if eradication is feasible or not. So the eradication is to eliminate it from here and to keep it from spreading as well into Otsego Lake um, or other water bodies. We're going to move on to land and talk about a rapid response project we do with terrestrial invasive species. This is Japanese angelica tree in Springfield. This is it here on the left. Um, this is an unusual tree as, as you'll see in a, a few minutes. Okay. Um, interesting, interesting plant. So uh, in 2018, a small stand of Japanese angelica tree was found in Springfield. Uh, if you can see the dots on the map here, there were a total of about 30 stems concentrated in this one area by this property. It's not far from Otsego Lake. It's not far from woods across Route 80. Okay. Uh, Japanese angelica tree is considered to be a high priority invasive for New York State and for our region. Uh, it is much more prevalent in the lower Hudson Valley uh, and in northern New Jersey and parts of Pennsylvania. Okay. Um, there is also a, a native uh, tree called Hercules Club uh, that uh, looks very, very similar. You find it here and there in New York State, um, but a little bit more south. Okay. Uh, this 
this sighting here was the first reported instance in Otsego County. And to my knowledge, uh, it is still the only, uh, the only trees of this species that have been found in Otsego County, the only ones that have been reported to IMAP. Okay. And once we identified it here, we uh, applied to the Catskill Regional Invasive Species Partnership for a project grant uh, that included education as well as an eradication project for this. We said, we decided that this was concentrated enough that we might be able to do an actual eradication project on this species. So I mentioned this is a pretty interesting tree. Um, if we go back here, right, we see what it looks like. Um, it's a, I guess a shrubby tree, I would say. It grows to be about 30 to 40 feet tall. And it has this, as this characteristic, these enormous, enormous leaves that are very, very feathery. Okay, so we come back here. Uh, this is one single leaf that's kind of held up against the front of my car. It's probably about two and a half feet long from the end of the leaf stalk all the way to the tip and about two feet wide. These things can get about three feet long or so and two, two and a half feet wide. And they are composed of multiple leaflets. It's what's known as a doubly compound leaf. It's really, really pretty cool. Okay. Um, and it grows, if you're familiar with sumacs, the, the shape of the tree is kind of like a sumac only bigger where you have one kind of trunk and then sort of curving branches. It, it's not a big branched tree like, uh, you know, maples. Um, so uh, in late summer, uh, it gets these little sprays of white foamy kind of flowers uh, right from the middle of the, the trunk there. Okay. Um, you see the effect here over on the left. It's really, like I said, it's a really attractive uh, tree in a certain way. It's kind of frothy flowers and these big feathery leaves are almost tropical in a way. Um, as summer wears on and into fall, the uh, it will produce purplish black berries that are eaten by birds and disseminated by birds. And our concern was that uh, this was being spread. We've had people looking for it elsewhere in the county. And again, so far, no one has found it. Uh, and then one of the most distinctive features of this tree is that it is very, very spiny. Um, particularly when it's young, it has these very sharp, numerous spines. As the tree gets older, those kind of wear down a little bit and may become more uh, prickly. But uh, this is not a tree you want to stumble into. Okay. Um, so it's uh, the native species is referred to as devil's walking stick because uh, particularly as a sapling, it'll grow nice and straight, six, eight feet tall, whoops, uh, six or eight feet tall. And um, uh, yeah, uh, all prickly like the devil's walking stick. So so the, the area in question is kind of an interesting one. The, the population is confined to this space between the guardrail up here on Route 80 and driveway garage of a of a property. Uh, I'm going to go back for a second to this. Again, concentrated here. What we found is that the owners of the property are from New Jersey, where they have a big issue with this particular tree. And one of the neighbors said that they bring potted plants with them and they will sometimes throw the plants up kind of behind the garage here. And so it's possible that that there were some seeds mixed in with the soil that got established. Um, it's also very likely it looked like there had been some utility line work uh, done in this area, which probably cleared some space and allowed some light for this tree to kind of get established. Um, there were about 33 stems on site. Um, the biggest was a tree size that was probably about 24 feet tall and I can't remember the diameter on it. Um, we did measurements on the diameter. Uh, most of them were smaller. Okay. Um, so what we did is we surveyed the area. We took GPS points. Um, we marked them with flagging. Now, when we started this, our, our objective, our thinking was that we were going to do a, you know, cut them down and dig them up uh, kind of project and then replant. But what we found is we did research, which included talking to folks down in New Jersey and Pennsylvania that have dealt with this as well as the Department of Transportation folks um, who have dealt with this down in uh, Hobart area. 
is that this is the kind of tree that if you if you cut it down, it sprouts like a hydra. So cut one down and three or four will take its place growing from the roots. And if you grub out the roots, you have to get them all or else they will likely re-sprout from the roots. So we kind of determined that the best approach would be uh, actually a chemical treatment. Okay, So we hired a uh, certified uh, applicator uh, he came in and did what was known as a pre-emergent treatment with Pathfinder 2 uh, herbicide, which has been found to be very effective on woody vegetation, um, particularly in, in including uh, this particular tree. He used a basal bark spray, which minimizes drift and minimizes contact with non-target organisms. So you walk around with a backpack sprayer and you apply this directly to the bottom six or eight inches or so of the tree in question. Okay. Um, and then it absorbs in through the bark and is a systemic uh, herbicide. Okay. Uh, we've been doing some follow-up monitoring, kind of revisiting the site or stopping by or surveying from the road as we drive past. Uh, and we're finding significant mortality. I have to get back in there to do a final survey for the fall, but I would say we're looking at about 80% mortality. Um, most of the growth that I've observed is from the small plants, which is troublesome. Uh, the, the large ones all are either dead or in the case of one of them is significant, had significantly reduced growth. So we're going to keep an eye on this and uh, see what happens from here and potentially do additional treatments if necessary. Okay, but this is an example of we found a population, you know, early detection, small population, um, and developed a response plan and implemented that response plan. Okay, and again, our goal here is eradication and we're hoping we did that. Now last year before we were able to treat it, uh, one of the things that I did was go in there with a pole pruner and I snipped off the flowers before they could go to fruit, which uh, hopefully will help prevent further spread. So now if we talk about control projects as opposed to flat out eradication, we're gonna take a look at water chestnut, Trapanatans. Uh, water chestnut is a rooted, floating aquatic plant that likes lakes and ponds and sheltered areas or slow moving uh, rivers. Okay. Um, and pretty much everything from where my cursor is down is water chestnut. Okay, and these plants can grow to be about a foot across or so or 16 inches across uh, these leaflets. Um, when they're in high populations, they, they will cover the water surface and block light from reaching the bottom. They're not a good food source for most animals. It impedes boating and fishing and swimming and uh, also the nuts that the water chestnut produce, and I didn't get any pictures of them, uh, have four very, very sharp spines that if you step on them, you can get hurt. Okay. Um, so here's a slightly smaller infestation. Again, you see how, how it can grow across the surface. Um, Right. Now in Otsego County, there were six known populations of water chestnut prior to 2020. Probably the most famous one countywide is the one in Goodyear Lake, the stump lot portion of Goodyear Lake. Uh, OCCA has been involved with the Goodyear Lake Association in hand pulling water chestnuts there since 2005. We've been at it for a long time. Okay. Um, in Silver Lake in New Berlin, we were contacted by the lake owner there uh, a few years back about a water chestnut issue that he was having. And so we've been working with them since 2018, again, on hand pulling, trying to reduce the population, um, keep it from spreading. And so as much as we would like to say that it's eradication, uh, really we're looking at managing the population, controlling the population, keeping it down and keeping it from spreading uh, to other water bodies. So we surveyed nine, nine sites specifically for water chestnut. Okay. Uh, there were two new infestations found and we did major hand pulling at effort at two sites. So the two sites where we did the major hand pulling efforts were Silver Lake over here by New Berlin and Goodyear Lake. Okay. We did some hand pulling here at Larchwood 
and some hand pulling up here at what is known as Beekman's Bog in um, Cherry Valley, as well as, you know, this is Allen Lake where we we found a few plants and we were able to pull them right out. Okay. So the, the nice thing about these control efforts, the hand pulling efforts is it's an opportunity to involve the community. Um, anybody can do it. Uh, you spend a nice day out on the water and you pull water chestnuts and you store them in your canoe and then you take them off someplace else. Okay. Um, and you know, these, the, the picture on the left is from a pull at Goodyear Lake and um, you know, the nice thing is you can paddle around there and not find a huge amount sometimes. Uh, on the right hand side, this actually is a haul from Goodyear Lake. Uh, we've got quite a bit there this year. Uh, on the left, we get an example of part of why we do want to control this. This is one single plant here, okay, with a long, long underwater root. So one seed produced this and it produced one, there's at least two here, two, we counted about six rosettes that were all attached to this one central stem and each of these rosettes can produce probably eight, at least eight nuts that could be potential new plants next year. And just for a sense of scale, uh, my kayak here is 12 feet long. So we estimated that this is about 15, 16 feet long. Um, so our control efforts here, we organized six pulls uh, that we involved members of the public in at uh, our Goodyear Lake and Silver Lake in particular. We ended up with 34 volunteers over those six days, uh, put in about 21 hours. I did not calculate the volunteer hours on this one entirely. And we removed 1,135 pounds of water chestnut. These were taken up to Mohegan Farm and composted. Okay. Um, quite a bit, quite a lot. Okay. So as much as we'd like to eradicate this plant, as much as we might be able to eradicate it from here or there, uh, it may not be feasible and control is, is probably the best option here. So, um, you know, at a place like Allen Lake where we found three or four plants, we're hoping that we eradicated it from there. The question that becomes a concern is whether it will be reintroduced accidentally or not. Um, and just a note on control and how possible this is. Uh, a couple of years back, I was searching for some photos um, and I found this shot from 2006. This is Goodyear Lake. Everything green on the water in this picture is water chestnut. Okay, uh, it covered acres of the stump lot. Um, now, as luck would have it in 2018, I took a picture and it happened to be from almost the exact same spot, a little different. And this is what we found okay, or didn't find. Um, so hand pulling is a potential management strategy. You just need a lot of, you need to put in time and effort. Um, and that, that is really how it goes with, uh, with any invasive species uh, control efforts. Okay, it takes time, it takes, it takes effort, it takes often a lot of people working. Uh, and this also brings me finally to education. Uh, we have done a lot of invasive species education programs over the years. Now I will say that education is part of everything we do. And so when we have volunteers who are coming out to pull water chestnut, let's say we educate them about what the plant is, why it's a problem, and as well as how to, you know, how to remove it, how to prevent it from spreading. Uh, our preference is to do education programs with people in the room, so to speak, um, in the field, um, boots, boots muddy, you know, clothes wet, you know, kind of thing. Um, but obviously this year that uh, became problematic uh, in, with the pandemic. Um, so what we did is we shifted to a lot of online programs. Uh, we've done six invasive species webinars specifically. Uh, several of them have been the spotlight on invasives like today. We also did a training to teach people how to use IMAP invasives. Um, we had about 77 people in attendance during the live programs, which, you know, we'd like to have more. Um, alas, 
that's how it goes. Um, we've also recorded the, our webinars and put them up on YouTube. We've had about 120 views so far. Again, not the greatest, um, but it's something. And what's also nice is we've I've actually had people who attended one of my uh, programs who contacted me about a potential Emerald Ash Borer site. So it was nice to see that people were using um, what they had learned in, in our programs. Okay. Um, every year in New York State, uh, New York State sponsors an Invasive Species Awareness Week. Uh, this year, uh, as in past years, we created a series of invasive species posts. Be on the lookout typically was our theme, which would feature uh, either a, a species that is found here or is not found here yet that we are, are watching for, such as the northern snakehead. Uh, we had reaches of more than 2,800 this year on our posts, and uh, we also did, using social media, uh, some live videos. So, you know, we're live on Goodyear Lake pulling water chestnut. We're live at Silver Lake uh, looking for frog bit, and uh, those were viewed by about 800 people. So, you know, it, it, it's nice to, to, to use that, um, use those venues. Okay. Uh, so what is, and, and actually what I should mention is that again, uh, our volunteer efforts are also educational in nature. So between the uh, frog bit pulls and the, the uh, water chestnut pulls, we had about 40 people participate. And those 40 people are people who are educated and hopefully bringing the message elsewhere. Okay. Uh, and we also did, and it's not available yet, but we worked with the Otsego Land Trust and the uh, watershed stewards who, who inspect boats for the Catskill Regional Invasive Species Partnership to produce a video on boat washing that should be up and available soon. So what's next for us? Uh, what's next for OCCA? We'd obviously like to return to, you know, programming as normal, whether that happens or not, we'll see. Um, for our early detection and rapid response programs. We are continuing the program for 2021. Uh, this is a time of year now where we are seeing a lot of the plants in particular um, die back, um, go into dormant phase. So field work is going to be dropping off. So it's planning time. So our grant with the DEC for the rapid response uh, early detection will go through next year. Uh, so during this next few weeks and months, we'll be identifying our priority sites for 2021, getting in touch with landowners if necessary, um, setting up a plan for how we're going to proceed through the summer of 2021. We're also looking to seek funds to supplement our rapid response efforts. One of the things we found is that the money really covered early detection, but it didn't cover the rapid response quite as much. So we're looking for additional money to, uh, to help uh, with that. And then we're also going to seek funds to continue our early detection efforts beyond 2021. In terms of management, uh, we will continue to follow up the monitoring of the Aralia, the Japanese Angelica tree that is, uh, if necessary, which it looks like it will be necessary, necessary we'll uh, uh, conduct additional treatment uh, we will be continuing our water chestnut work at Goodyear Lake and Silver Lake for sure. And we're looking to revive the chop and cheese events. And chop and cheese was uh, something we started a couple of, actually we started it really last year, where we had volunteers come into our base of operations at Mohican Farm and um, work at cutting back and digging up a stand of invasive Japanese knotweed. And when the work was done, we would serve cheese and car crackers and uh, beverages, um, which it, it was nice for controlling the knotweed. It was nice for getting people together and uh, educating and getting work done. So we're hoping to be able to bring that back. And in terms of education, yes, we will. Uh, I think that we found that the online venue uh, is a pretty good way to reach people. Uh, because you know you can reach people in the area. In Otsego County presents certain uh, challenges. It's a big county. Uh, it can take a long time to get from one end to the other. So if we do a program and you say, "Oh well, it's in Cooperstown. It's easy to get to," you know, somebody from down in Otego might not agree, or vice versa. 
Um, so the online efforts give people an opportunity to participate if they're a little bit far away or also to participate later on if they can't make it live and in person. Um, we do want to conduct more in-person events where safe as the season has gone on. We have found ways to do, for example, water chestnut pulling with social distancing. Um, so it, you know, we're, we're slowly working back into in-person events. Um, our emphasis for education will be a lot on early detection. So, and the emerging threats. So uh, expect to hear about things like the spotted lanternfly, uh, or hydrilla um, or the snakehead species that are not necessarily here in our area, but are kind of creeping in. Um, we want to create more opportunities for citizen science. Uh, we actually have been involved with a, a plot to monitor for emerald ash borer, which we didn't really talk about today, um, and for hemlock woolly adelgid. And those are things we'd like to uh, expand a little bit and have more people involved in. And uh, something important for us is that we get all ages involved. Okay, uh, Kids like to get involved in this, older people like to get involved in this um, and make a difference in their community. And then I'll just add that, you know, much as we saw with the Goodyear Lake, success is possible. This is our kind of before and after of Japanese knotweed removal at Mohican. So um, it just takes time, it takes effort, and it takes involvement, which we're all about. So first off, thank you very much for your participation today. Uh, here are some upcoming programs that we're offering. September 19th, Naked Eye Astronomy. This is a live in-person event. Registration is open, it is free. Uh, we are asking, uh, we are limiting the number of attendees to 30. So register at our website. Uh, September 23rd, Heat Smart Mohawk Valley kickoff. This is a, uh, a Zoom meeting. Our registration is information is on our website. On September 27th, we are having a, a canoe paddle on the Butternut Creek. Uh, OCCA does have a limited number of canoes that are available, uh, or you can bring your own. Uh, and then on October 16th, we will be having a walk at the Leatherstock and Golf Course. The course manager there will be uh, showcasing the practices that and techniques he uses to keep the greens playable and to do this in as environmentally friendly a manner as he can. Uh, information about all of our programs is available at our website, OCCAinfo.org. Thank you all very, very much. Uh, and with that, we're going to close our program.